Good morning, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manos and Manos, once again, for creating this perfect combination between uh, science and friendships. This is really a unique experience. So let's go. Besides the embarrassing picture, Anna Katerina Shaw, I have no disclosure for this topic. So we talk about partial rotator cuff tears. Uh, as we know in the previous presentation, um, the overall prevalence uh, of partial rotator cuff tear is around 13 to 32%, so very lower compared to uh, full thickness tear. And there is a difference in age. It looks like that in younger people, they are less frequent than over 60. And usually they are more frequent in female in their middle age, basically. But pay attention because most of them actually are not symptomatic. Therefore, it is very probable that maybe, especially in the younger age, there is an underestimation of the real prevalence. First, I want to talk about location, because location will help us to understand the etiology. And probably this is not really a connection with a conservative treatment, but for sure has a connection for the natural history and for the operative treatment. So they are usually divided in the intertendinous tears, articular and bursal sided. Although literature is conflicting about prevalence of this, um, of this type of lesion, it looks like, especially looking at cadaveric studies, that intratendinous one are more common type lesion. I know none of you would have been guessed on this, but intratendinous looks like the more common, followed by the articular sided lesion, which are basically two to three times more common than bursal one. And so, as I said, the location help us to understand the etiology of this lesion. Uh, the one that we know less, basically, are the intertendinous one, because, as I said, uh, much more information we got it by uh, cadaveric study rather than, rather than clinical information. So probably uh, they come from sure forces of on a degenerated tendon. But what I think is. Uh, uh, interesting about intratendinous lesion, and actually, uh, I saw sometimes in the OR that it come up isolated or even in combination with bursal or articular sided tear in a different part of the rotator cuff, and I think it's interesting. For the articular sided, for the articular sided, they basically can be acute, so traumatic or chronic, used by the generation, but most commonly, uh, they are related to a phenomenon of uh, the internal impeachment, maybe in over at the athlete. So their location uh, is specifically, most of the time, in the interval between supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendon from the articular side. What about bursal side? The bursal side, once again, can be acute, so following a, a traumatic issue, or most of the time they are chronic, just related to abrasion and some phenomenon of subacromial impingements. But when we think about if we should treat this lesion and how should we treat this lesion, for sure one of the questions is, is there a third progression? What I'm seeing is just what I'm going to see even in 10 years from now. Well, as Anna Katerina already said, actually, uh, full thickness serve for sure and large more frequently, uh, but, but also partial thickness uh, tear can enlarge, can become a full thickness, um, and this happens in up 26% of the cases, especially for high grade uh, tear basically so they enlarge but they do it very slowly they take years to do it and usually there is a direct combination between increase of symptom and uh, enlargement of a tear what we also need to keep in mind is that they have a real poor healing potential but they can stay there forever so I talk about high grade and low grade, but uh, we don't know the meaning yet. So we saw that they can have uh, a different location, so articular, bursal, or interstitials, but um, a more common classification uh, for the imaging, but especially in, uh, in the arthroscopic field, is the Elman classification, which is quite old, but still, uh, still usable, actually. They define not only location, but all the thickness of the tendon involved. And the thickness of the tendon involved has been the main guide uh, to treatment for a very long time. So we say that low-grade tears are basically the tear that involve less than 25% or less than 50% of the um, thickness of the tendon from the bursal or from the articular side. Either uh, high-grade thickness are the one that involve more than 50% 
of the thickness of the tendon. Another useful classification by mainly arthroscopic is the Snyder classification. Basically, it involves only articular and bursal component and then uh, as a subtype for uh, um, involvement of thickness of the tendon. And then later on, there, um, there are some other lesions that has been defined mainly arthroscopically just to be more specific on articular side. It's, uh, as we say, they're more common than bursal one. So let's go back to clinics and what we say, can we understand just looking at the patient, just visiting the patients, that he really has a partial thickness there? Um, this is quite difficult, actually, um, because there is not a real distinction between partial rotator cuff tear symptoms and other rotator cuff disorder. When I think to a rotator cuff tear, when I have in front of me a young patient that maybe has a trauma and he has a shoulder pain, but he has not actually um, a weakness problem, or when I saw a lady in their middle age that has um, a pain that um, the onset was not traumatic, uh, was kind of chronic, she has pain but no weakness, so I can think to a partial tear or a calcific tendonitis, but for sure I need some imaging to make a clear diagnosis. And when it came to imaging, I know many in this room use ultrasound, especially if they can, pour, can perform by themselves. I'm not a huge fan of ultrasound, so I usually ask for an MRI uh, based on literature results. Uh, um, uh, magnetic resonance arthrogram should be the best choice, especially for articular sided tear, actually. But I think that a good combination with cost and efficiency um, could be uh, a night field MRI, basically. And then comes to treatment. Uh, when should we repair partial thickness rotator cuff tear? Should we rush this decision? So I see a lesion and I need to operate on this lesion. This is a randomized clinical trial on 78 patients affected by high grade partial thickness rotator cuff tear. So this was one of the main indications to surgery up to now. And they basically compared two groups. In the first group, they immediately repaired the lesion. In the second one, they delayed the surgery after six months. And what's funny that during this time, some of the patients, I guess 10, um, just drop out the, because they get, they're getting better. But the one who arrived to the surgery, after comparing the results for three years, they noticed that basically there were no significant difference between groups. So pay attention, we don't really need to rush the decision to a surgical treatment, even because um, partial thickness tear are one of the main cause of postoperative shoulder stiffness. So how many times absent you have a, a stiffness after repairing um, a partial thickness tear and you think, oh, maybe that partial thickness tear was related to the beginning of a frozen shoulder rather than um, that there was real the problem. And this happened in up, in, in up to 40% of cases. So keep the eye on it. Maybe you don't need to rush this decision. This is a reasonable, a reasonable uh, treatment algorithm that basically uh, suggests conservative management at least for three to six months um, in any cases, uh, uh, regardless if it is a uh, high, high grade or low grade tear, if it, regardless if it's articular side or bursal side. And then if it fails, just you consider surgery. Uh, but do we have some, predict some predictor of failures after conservative treatment? Yes, most patients we need to keep an eye or to, to kind of uh, talk to patient and say maybe, maybe it is possible that even after conservative treatment you're going to need a surgery as the one to have a, a dominant side affected, a bursal tear and of course an eye grade tear. So what's our, our treatment option? Uh, as usual, anti-inflammatory medication, rest, activity modification, but the mainstay are for sure physical therapy, mainly based on capsular stretching, especially when involved um, overhead athlete um, and phenomenon of uh, restriction of internal rotation deficit and strengthening of the size of the rotator cuff, but also uh, periscapular muscle. Uh, Besides physical therapy, subacromial injection are another interesting option. So 
So let's see what result we got. This is a study on 708 patients in UK. Uh, it's a multi-century study. They basically compare the, um, the, eff the efficacy of physical therapy with the physiotherapist, just instructed by the physiotherapy, but with a known program, uh, with or without a, cost a corticosteroid injection at the beginning of the treatment. What do they say? Um, they find out that basically corticosteroid injection does not change the results of the treatments, and there are no difference uh, between exercise in, um, in a structure with a the physical therapy or a henome-based program after, of course, receiving instruction by the physical therapy. So physical therapy is for sure a good option, but what about uh, injection? This um, um, systematic review actually compared corticosteroids and PRP. And what they saw that was PRP actually uh, can achieve some small better results significant from um, at least a statistical standpoint in the short term, in the mid term, and also in the long term on uh, basic or every functional outcomes. But if we compare uh, platelet-rich plasma, which has high cost, as you know, to hyaluronic acid, this very recent paper just showed that there are no difference between one single uh, PRP injection and three doses of uh, uh, hyaluronic acid at three months. And other promising options, but we really don't have results yet because these are two pilot study, is the use of adipose-derived stem cells as, um, as an injection, subacromial injection or intratendinous injection. But we'll see in the future. So, in conclusion, partial thickness there are probably more common than expected, as a prob um, particularly the intratendinous one. Conservative treatment is the first line of option. Keep an eye when you find a patient with a bursal side and partial thickness, high grade partial thickness there, that maybe uh, that's the case that conservative treatment can fail, but you got time, you don't need rush, to rush your decision to, uh, to the operative field because uh, a result do not change even if you delayed your surgery. Uh, physical therapy and subacromial injection are the mainstay of treatment. Uh, in my clinical practice, I used to combine both these options so physical therapy and my choice are um, hyaluronic acid in injection because I can avoid side effect of corticosteroid injection but at the same time they have a, uh, a low cost compared to a lower cost compared to PRP injection. Thank you. Please be with us in Milan in uh, the next ESCA Congress in 2024. Thank you.